we're still going to be talking about war in Europe and about security and the relationship between uh, security and uh, the economy. And question how does the war contribute to change our economy and our um, prerequisites for Norwegian foreign policy? So, Claudia Duhem Andresen, she's worked in the Bank of Norway. And now she has another job. Morten Andersen, he is a researcher in NUPI. He's a project manager having to do with uh, foreign investment and comparing that with national security. And then we're going to first have an introduction from Cora Martinson, who is a professor for uh, the relationship between security and commerce and uh, economic warfare. What is that? She's going to tell us. I'm going to use my uh, lawyer time as best I can. There are two points. First, a warning that if anybody thinks that uh, what I have to say sounds uh, uh, very uh, warring, it is uh, one person said, we are. They are a lot more aggressive than what I will say compared to her. There are two things I want to say. What is economic warfare? Quite simply put, uh, this has to do with uh, uh, there are bilateral conflicts between companies that are resolved through negotiation. And if that doesn't work, then they go to an international agency. But um, economic warfare, that is a strategic plan to um, weaken another country's economy. So then plans are worked out, and there are resources uh, available to uh, carry it out. China has done that since 2013 with their China 2025 plan. On the West part, we thought that was just a kind of an ambition, but uh, they really meant business with it. What we noticed first was that America, USA, the politicians saw how this directly impacted uh, sectors where America was uh, the leader. And then EU finally woke up. Now the EU and uh, America are pretty much in line with one another that there is economic warfare with China. We are in economic warfare with Russia as well. Uh, von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, um, said that what the EU should do, that was a, a declaration of warfare. We're going to weaken uh, Russia's ability to wage war. I have been going around talking about uh, my book, and I've discovered something important, that the understanding of the impact on Norway uh, and people's understanding of that varies greatly. Uh, back in the day, um, our Norwegian security interests were different. In the past, uh, the parliament felt that you needed to come to uh, an understanding in the ministry and the affected men, uh, or agencies what the uh, threats and economic threats meant. But that hasn't happened. If this project, uh, uh, that the response under the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs is going to be consequential, then you need to have a greater degree of awareness around what we are mixed up in, what in the process of. Um, you need to have an impression us that uh, uh, some people think that Norway is a passing um, evil. Uh, but that's not the way it is. We are right in the midst of a process. This is the normal situation, and that's the way it's going to be in the future as well. Okay, Claudia, we'd like to begin with you for a follow-up on that. Things don't look so promising. Is that your assessment as well? This war that we have now, that creates a lot of challenge for the world economy, for sure. That is the biggest problem in Europe. But these uh, high costs of energy and this uh, insane uh, price growth has created a completely new situation in the world economy, which 
has contributed to higher interest rates, uh, lower economic growth, and greater differences. And that also creates problems in itself that can also limit to what we are able to do in foreign policy. So I've always been concerned that that when you think about security and strategy, that you'd also need to include the economic perspective. And that has become all the more clear when you see how that impacts and puts limits on what we're able to do. Norway is limited by the fact that the economy in Europe is going poorer because it's our biggest uh, trade partner. And um, interest rates are so high, that puts us in this unpleasant situation. For us, we have to figure out how we're going to prioritize so that we can maintain good relationship with our European friends um, while we're doing that. How is Norway going to do that? Do you have any solution for that? We see that this debate lately, we see the tension between uh, domestic policy and foreign policy. How can these things, how can they be, uh, how are we going to cope with this? Uh, that things are difficult. How are we going to do it? Is this a foreign policy thing? or is it something we can do? I think we have to have two thoughts in your mind at the same time. I do quite agree that uh, foreign policy I exists uh, so to make domestic policy possible, but it's not uh, alone dependent on that. If internal uh, agreements, uh, disagreements are prominent, that can limit what you do uh, and from a foreign policy objective too. We have high energy prices partly because there's an energy crisis in Europe. And that's something that we simply have to deal with and take seriously. And if the disappointment is uh, great enough, then that will help put a damper on what we can do internationally. But if there's a desire for uh, an increase of internationalization and more focus on, uh, 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 I think that's very um, unfortunate when in light of the situation we're now in. Uh, we have to invest both internal distribution, stability, welfare, in order to be able to do the things that we want to do internationally. And I also believe, as we heard previously, uh, be willing to use some of these extraordinary income that we had last year. We had a thousand million crowns uh, more than we thought because of our export of energy. I'm not going to give specific advice, but I think that we need to come across to Europe as a party that invests in the European future. I think it's important that we are perceived as such. Do you think that we're going to go into a uh, uh, isolationist position? I think we have all reason to be afraid of that. You see tendencies uh, of that, that people, we need to be on guard against that, that our resources, when they are scarce, that we are careful and that the economic differences uh, between countries are not th that great because that will create political problems farther down the road. So economic uh, warfare in a protectionist world, what are the challenges there? You talked to, uh, yeah. Uh, Norway is vulnerable and one of the reasons is that uh, these triggering uh, mechanisms um, work more and more poorly. And it's in a point of stagnation. In the summertime, it was a bit paradoxical. He's talking about some agencies that he's not naming, so I'm not quite getting that. But I think what we are seeing here is that the world economy is regulated, you find different mechanisms to resolve conflicts within these various regions. And then it's clear that it's no doubt where we belong. The problem is that the United States so far has uh, entered into regional uh, agreements with uh, these regions, but not with Norway. So we don't have a lot of room to negotiate in these areas as I see it. So we are forced into a choice uh, between uh, uh, that friendly governments will have to take. I think it's going to be, it's not going to be without cost because we will have to relinquish certain things. 
we have to uh, defend a liberal world order as far as we can because that's based on respect and the mutuality, uh, respect for countries no matter what their size. And if we can uh, maintain that as best as possible through a new regional world order, uh, we need to do that because, uh, because otherwise things will stagnate. So he's asking him to elaborate. So we see that, that what Janet Yellen called for, where you defend the, deliver the suppliers, especially in view of the uh, corona in China and China's use of their own economic uh, power to uh, see things their way and press certain countries out in con connection with uh, rare earth metals and so on. But then there's, uh, there is a kind of split, a splitting up of the world's uh, commerce. A uh, hundred years ago, uh, you see, the thing is that in China, they have more of these than other countries. And we need to aim for reducing the vulnerability by um, trading less with countries like that so that they don't uh, exploit their position. But what about this in, uh, foreign investment? There is a project. Uh, in what way are these projects a threat, a security threat for Norway? Money is the main thing that, that flows across borders. So that if a company wants to uh, see something they want, and they, they can invest in another country if they can get their way in one country. So investment has been basically unregulated. So, and the, the flow has passed mostly from rich countries to uh, development, developing countries. But the last 10, 15 years or so, you've seen that some untraditional companies that have begun to invest. We've seen from China, there's a stream of investment and Russian and the Gulf states between these two. And so there's a, a number of differences. One of them is that we ha not cannot have a security cooperation with those countries. The other difference is that the uh, border between what is private and what is uh, government is unclear. You cannot be sure what side of the line the Chinese uh, companies are at any one time. The problem is that there's so much lack of regulation. The investment, uh, uh, the emphasis is on profits, earning money. But then the government, uh, they are the ultimate owners of some of these uh, agencies, and so national interests enter in behind the investment. And so then the calculation is different. For one thing, uh, you have more a long-term calculation that uh, involves uh, national interests. But the other one is, involves a, uh, a challenge to national security. And it can, for sure. First of all, because it can create dependency. We saw that during the pandemic. We saw how about the uh, access to medical equipment and uh, um, uh, vaccines. There are many things. Uh, accessibility for electricity, when you're dependent on that. If you are dependent upon an external supplier, like the Russians, which is ultimately a state, uh, a state organization, to transfer of technology is another security challenge, potentially. Uh, knowledge, we can be transferred from Norway, in our case, to another player, which then can misuse it against our interests. And then classic things like sabotage and uh, economic uh, spying, uh, spying and, and so on. So in, the, uh, in the, the last few years, there have been a, a lot of attention on these things. Does this require a different toolkit than the one we've talked about? Uh, uh, as we heard, military preparedness can't resolve all this, right? The response that we see is often what we call for screening or, uh, arrangements. There are mechanisms that filter out into investments that can potentially be damaging. There's a risk to that, and we need to look at that. And we've seen a big increase of screaming uh, mechanisms lately, 
even more so after the pandemic and in Europe and Australia. And this is something that we are prepared and are uh, concerned with in Norway with our legislation about security. And you just can think um, at the airports uh, with your metal detectors, most things can pass through. Uh, but then some things they figure that we have to check more carefully. This is a huge dilemma because in Norway, we are one of the most open economies in the world. And we have a lot of advantage. Uh, th we get a lot of advantage through international economies. But if we become too sensitive, then we can shut out a lot of investment that we need. But on the other hand, but if the sector isn't working as well as it can, then there's a risk um, and a threat, you can say, uh, against Norway. There's a dilemma here when it comes to investment about between openness and liberty on the one hand and security on the other. That's a dilemma that we know from uh, monitoring and surveillance uh, to immigration. You can say this is a, the liberal dilemma. How open should we be? Uh, how much security interest should we uh, have regard for? So, but then the situation today has some new features. So I was thinking one thing that's important here and this conference here can be a turning point for us. And that is that awareness of what this means for an economy uh, like Norway's, uh, that we have, um, that we realize that economic warfare affects us too. Previously, we had a foretaste of this in 2014. That led to a kind of a uh, restriction of sanctions, but not much more. Anna Solberg was interviewed on that in the Alfenpolsen. She said that, oh, there was a feeling that we just had to move on. That feeling is gone now. We are to make to move on, but we must learn from what we've been through, and we have understood this both from the the politicians and uh, this forum is a good example of the uh, uh, discussion that's taken place, so that we're all aware of how it affects us, but also to understand what dilemma this involves, both for the government and for Norwegian economy, and I do believe. <coughs> that this will uh, be an important step forward, forums like this. I have a question for you. How, no matter how long the war is going to last, how uh, long will these consequences of this economic warfare is going to be with us uh, into the future? That's a very good question. And it's even harder to answer now in these past few weeks because when we see the um, interest rates have been risen, which are a consequence of, of the war. So it is potentially going to damage the financial system. And uh, we might wind up with a financial crisis that we had in 2008. That may not be the most likely outcome, but if it does happen, that will bring a recession and it's going to bring great economic challenges that will, the effects of which will be with us for many years to come. I think that maybe uh, we're better at handling it today uh, so that we can handle a, a, a recession better today than in the past. But in the midst of all of this, just to comment with what's French shoring, that is something uh, uh, Norway is constantly being squeezed between, between the United States and China. We ought perhaps to use Chinese technology to build out our 5G network that might have been cheaper and more effective, but we don't do it for strategic reasons. And in Italy, they have gone away. Um, this uh, random uh, understanding with China, with this certain project that, that she mentions, they have uh, gone back on that because they see that's not the way to go. And Nor Norway, that is a small economy, we're just a small uh, uh, you know, player in this matter. And when you think that uh, we can't just think of what we're going to get out of our investments, we have to invest in Europe and our friends uh, who share our values uh, so that we can have uh, more legs to stand on in what I believe is going to be a difficult time to come. And on that note, we're going to have a Skavlan moment, and I think uh, so please thank this uh, panel for their discussion.